Hi, everybody. My name is James L. Allen. This is James L. Allen Country Cooking and Variety Show. We're here at Post 4647 in Antelope, California, with the VFW people here. They're really nice, and I, we all should salute our veterans. I mean, they put their life on the line so we can have freedom, whether it's in this country or in another country, okay? But I appreciate you tuning in. You can go to YouTube, James L. Allen Country Cooking and Variety Show, or you can go to my Facebook, James L. Allen, uh, James Allen, Sacramento, California, and uh, our website will be up next week, and we'll have that for you, okay? But I appreciate you tuning in, and tell your friends and family and neighbors about us, okay? Hi, I'm Chef Natanya Richards from Simply Delicious Catering. And before we get started, I lost a friend this Saturday, Belinda Rainwater Mays. And she was so influential in me becoming a chef. In fact, she was probably one of the best cooks that I've ever met in my life. So this is for you, Belinda, and Mikey and Candace. I love you. Okay, today we're going to start making pasta leos. Now, this is a dish that's from Puerto Rico, but in other parts of the Caribbean, it may be called pastelitos, or you may have heard it as empanadas. In Jamaica, they call it the meat patty. Little different flavors in each one of those countries, but the basic concept is still the same. So again, when you see me make this, you can take your variation and add it to the same process. Make it yours. First, we're going to start off with the onion. Now, traditionally, we use a white onion. There we go. What we're going to do is just dice. Okay, so now that the onions are done, we're gonna finish cutting up some garlic. And we are just about ready. So what I'm gonna do is heat up a cast iron skillet. Bet you haven't seen those for a long time. Maybe you remember them at your grandmother's or your aunt's house, but I still love using my cast iron skillet. Highly recommend it. So while that's heating up, we're gonna add a little bit of olive oil. Now I'm waiting for that to get hot. I'm gonna go ahead and cut up some olives. And you just kinda of wanna give it a rough chop. Now, some people, they have a taste for this, other people not so much, but I found that it's not really overbearing in this dish. So if you're not accustomed to eating green olives with pimentos, don't panic, you can omit them, or give it a try. You'll find out it's not that bad, or it's not what you thought it would be. There, that looks good. So right now we're going to go ahead and add the garlic and the onions. And I'm just going to stir this around a little bit. And I'm also going to add some oregano. Now what I got is the whole oregano. So what you're going to do is probably about a tablespoon that I'm using. So I take some, get a pinch, and I'm going to rub it in my hands. add the rest here. All 
and we're going to give it a stir. Now, if you would like, you can add salt if salt is your thing. But in this particular dish, I really don't add salt because I get a lot from the brine from the olives plus from the sofrito that we'll be adding in soon. So it's a matter of choice. Now this just needs to cook a little bit more. And what we're gonna do is wait till the onions get a little clearer before we add our ground beef. Make sure your heat is not that high so you're not burning the garlic. I think that looks good. So let's add our ground beef. and we're gonna let this cook down. Okay, so as that browns, we're gonna start adding in our other ingredients. We're gonna start with some Sazon, and I use about two packets. Then tomato paste, and I'll add about a little tablespoon or more, probably about two tablespoons, actually. And then the olives, and I use approximately nine olives and then sofrito. You can make this homemade. It's a lot of work for me when I could just open up a jar. So this is great for fast cooking, especially with a lot of the Latin foods. It's kind of like a salsa with um, peppers, green peppers, onions, um, culantro, garlic, and olive oil. It adds a lot of flavor and it's a traditional part of this dish. So as this is cooking, Let's go ahead and add the sazon. The sazon enhances the flavor. And actually, I use it in a lot of things. Spaghetti sauces, barbecue sauce. It just, it's a little, slightly a little different. And again, it's something that I can say I make it my own. We're going to add the olives. and tomato paste. I use that as a thickener. Some people use tomato sauce, but I actually like the flavor of tomato paste better. And then next, some sofrito. Now I have some family members in Puerto Rico that have golden raisins. I happen to like that, but it's not a particular favorite of the rest of my family. But if you want to try it, it is delicious. So you just add some golden raisins at this point and just let it simmer down. It's looking good. Now I like a little bit of heat, so let's add a little Tabasco. Quick stir, and we're gonna let this cool. So if you feel like you have too much oil in the pan, go ahead and drain it, but you wanna leave a little bit in there, okay? So don't panic. And what we're going to do is add some to the discos. Fold it up. I start by making sure that I meet the top ends in. 
and I pinch it. Press down and I want to go around the sides. Now this is why it's important not to have too much oil because you don't want any seeping out. And go ahead and press all the way around. You're going to apply some pressure. Okay, until that's nice and sealed. You want to make sure that you're not going to puncture the dough though. So press around the edges. Now again, you can do a lot of different things with this. When you get a discos, you can fill it in with chicken and cheese and broccoli. You could use leftovers and make patties. This is one of my favorites. What I like to do is I take Korean beef, kimchi, onions, and a little bit of pepper jack cheese and put it in here and fry it up. So there's so many different uses for this. You can be totally creative. If you want to do something for the kids, even make it with sloppy joes. And I have to say that learning a lot from my friend Belinda, as I talked to you about earlier, to take what you have and make something new with it. And she taught me that a lot. I remember one time she had made some lima beans and as a child, <laughs> I'm sure both of you experienced the same thing, lima beans are probably one of the most disgusting things I thought on the face of this earth. So when she offered me some lima beans, I was, no thank you. And she says, oh, Natanya, you just got to try it. And I was like, no, I'm good. But she was very persistent, and I didn't want to hurt her feelings. So I took a bite. And I've been hooked on lima beans ever since. <laughs> In fact, I went back and got a big bowl of it when I was done with the little bite. She was an amazing cook, an amazing person. She'll be missed. Okay, now we have some there. And what I'm gonna do with this one, because this is something that I know my kids love, was I'm gonna add a little bit of cheese. And you can choose the type of cheese you'd like to use. And if you cannot find discos, I will put a recipe of how to make them on the site. Or you can just ask me. I'll give you the information to contact me when we're done. Now again, these are pastelillos, and every family has their own variation of that. And some people call them pastelitos, or empanadas, or empanadillos. And Jamaicans have their own delicious version called the meat patty. Golden crust is my favorite. Shout out to Golden Crust. You have a choice of frying them, baking them. It's completely your preference. Okay, 
So now, let's get ready to fry them up. Okay, so what we're looking to happen here is they're going to float, which they are. And you're looking for this golden brown color, which they are. The next party that you're having at your house watching the football game. I know people bring the traditional buffalo wings or sliders or barbecue pulled pork. Let's try something different. Give them a pastelillos. I know they'll love it. Or create something similar on your own. Like I said, you can use Korean beef with kimchi and onions. You can use chicken and cheese. You can even make sloppy joes and add it with cheese. Take this make it simple, make it delicious. And again, my name is Chef Natanya Richards. I have Simply Delicious Catering. Call me with any questions you have or recipe ideas that you may want. I'm at 916-519-6262. And you can reach me on Facebook at Simply Delicious Catering hyphen Chef Natanya Richards. I'd love to hear from you. Stay hungry, my friends. And go Niners. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm James L. Allen of Country Cooking and Variety Show. I'm here with some friends of mine, Max Ferry, Cheryl. Let me take ladies first. Cheryl Asby and Max Ferry, okay? Uh, they're with the Sacramento. Alzheimer's AIDS Society, okay? And they're going to tell you some of the things that they're doing at the society there, and they're going to tell you about this morning what you had mm -hmm. at Rancho Marietta. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, James. Well, this morning we went to Rancho Marietta to talk to a lady who's interested in setting up a support group out there. And it was really wonderful. She's excited about doing it. She wants to give, do a support group for caregivers as well as for patients because she feels like we do that if the caregivers and the patients are meeting at the same time in different rooms then it makes it so that the caregivers are able to come because they don't have to leave their loved one home alone or get someone to come in and sit with them and we have about 27 support groups from Wairika to Turlock and so this will make another one we're getting close to 30 now but we only have four, counting this one, uh, that actually do a patient group at the same time as the caregivers group. So while the caregivers are in there talking about what a pill their spouse or their mother or father have been, the patients are in another room behind closed doors saying, my spouse or my daughter or my son, they just don't get it. And it gives them both a chance to unload these burdens. And we don't know why it works because the patients, you might argue, but they don't remember what they did yesterday. That's true, but they unloaded a, a burden that's been weighing on them and they are now a much more manageable and uh, better to deal with for the next several days just because they got things off their chest and they also got to talk along with people that are similarly afflicted. Yeah, we had one <coughs> lady tell me her husband goes to a daycare program as well as coming to the patient support group and he was always really happy when he would get home. And she said, one day she said, why are you so happy when you get home from the support group and you mope around the house? And he said, because it's easy. I'm with people that are like me and I don't have to work so hard. And boy, that was an eye opener for all of us. And it made us realize the really the importance of the patient support group and what it actually does do for them. True, and another eye-opener along that line is the fact that caregivers forget that their patient, the one that they're taking care of, is doing the best that they can. 
And a lot of times they get worn out just by trying to do what we think is just functional. But they're really doing the best that they can and we need to remember that. And that's one of the reasons why the patient support groups work so well. They get to be amongst people like I said, similarly afflicted, mm -hmm. and they don't have to try so hard. Mm -hmm. They've got comfort in numbers. That's true. I had one of the patients yesterday in my support group tell me, you know, I just don't remember to do all the things that I'm supposed to do. So when I get out of the shower and I'm trying to get dressed, I'll put on my pants and my shirt and probably my shoes and socks, but I won't remember to tie my shoes. It's not that I can't do it, I just don't remember that that's one of the steps. And I thought, boy, doesn't that just give you an insight into their world and, and what it's like for them? Very true. I'm here with uh, Cheryl Asby and Max Perry, and uh, they've been telling you about the Alzheimer's AIDS Society and the work that they do in their support groups. I appreciate them being on the show. They're regulars here on my show. And uh, I don't care who you are, what race you are, somebody in your family has got dementia. Okay, or they're starting to get it. Okay, mm -hmm. it's just something you, you, some people can get by without it and some can't. I know people that are 100 years old that are still just as sharp as can be, mm -hmm. and there's so many that aren't. Okay, but I appreciate you folks coming down. You know, you're always welcome. You thank know you that. Thank you for the invitation. James, thank James. you. Okay, thanks. Okay, I'm here with my friend, saxophone player, Mr. Sean Rayford. Let's say you can go to YouTube, you can pull Sean's music up. He's going to be a regular on our show, and we're going to have his entire band, and he's going to be our, my doc service, okay? <laughs> it's only Sean. Thank you, sir. <laughs>
Okay, we're back with Sean Rayford. You heard that song, Everything Must Change. That was a song I asked him to play for me. It's one of my <laughs> favorites. But Sean, I tell uh, my viewers out there, what piqued your interest in music to begin with? I know the story, but they don't, okay? I actually started playing, it was a joke. Uh, my grandmother had a 75 year anniversary at her church and you know, everybody in my family, they sing or they preach and I sit in the back of the church, praying the Lord just gave me one more day. And uh, you know, my aunt asked, you know, what I was gonna do for my grandmother's anniversary. And I said, put me down for a saxophone solo. Didn't have a saxophone. And uh, go back a week later, my aunt has this program. And it has a Sean Rayford on there. I said, who's Sean Rayford? Well, needless to say, I had to get, end up getting a saxophone. I went and got one and sat down on a corner down in, in Vallejo, California, and learned how to play when the Saints go marching in. And I've been playing ever since. But it started out as a joke. <laughs> hey, it's no joke now. Okay, you're good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Like I told you, you're going to be my doc, Severson. We're uh, getting to that point. Yes, step sir. By step, okay? All right. But uh, hey, I appreciate you coming in today. And I know you can, the first show you were on, the first episode, you yes. did one song. You said you were gracious with, with two songs today. I appreciate I sure it, will. Sean. And yes. hey, you're good, man. Thank you, sir.
Hi, I'm Chef Natanya Richards at Post 4647, and I have a great guest here to share with you. Let me introduce you to Mary, who's part of the Women's Auxiliary. Come on, Mary, come and join me. Hi, my Hi. name is Mary Cummings. I'm a past president of the Auxiliary here at 4647. And could you tell me, what is the Women's Auxiliary? What is that? The Ladies Auxiliary has been in existence for something like a hundred years. This auxiliary here at 4647 has been in existence for 50 years, uh, 50 some years actually. We're here to support our veterans in any way we can. Whatever they ask us to do, we, we help them out in any way we can. We have a hospital program where we go to visit uh, patients in the hospital send them care packages, we visit the uh, veterans uh, hospitals, take them care packages. We have um, the Buddy Poppy program where we support hospitalized vets. They make all these uh, Buddy Poppies to be sold on the, on the street uh, to raise money for hospital vets. We support our post. We raise money any way we can, like having dinners, breakfast, raffles. Uh, we raise money to support our veterans. We ha support the stand down where homeless vets, homeless vets receive care packages, uh, new clothing, whatever they need, we have, try to help them with those donations. Uh, we support a junior girls. Um, we support a junior girls unit here. We teach our young ladies to how to be patriotic and how, pro protocol and uh, patriotism. So how does somebody help contribute to, the, to some of the donations that you do or part of this organization? Um, you can support us by making monetary donations, absolutely. Uh, by participating in our fundraisers, uh, participating in the dinners. Uh, Could you tell us a little bit more about the dinners? Every Friday night, one of the auxiliary, one of the units here, be it the ladies auxiliary, the men, the men's auxiliary, uh, uh, another part of the uh, VFW is, is uh, military order, the cooties. They have a dinner here every Friday night. They prepare the dinner, serve it to the members, the members can bring in guests. Uh, we have some kind of raffle to also raise money. The breakfasts are also, every Sunday night, every Sunday morning, sorry, every Sunday morning we have breakfast. And um, if you have something you wanna donate, like to, oh yeah, we do cab packages to the troops. Uh, we always solicit donations for care packages, uh, snacks, goodies, socks, anything that the troops can use overseas. We solicit those donations. And there's always someone here at the post that can accept those donations. Oh, that sounds great. Now, all the money goes back to the vets? Goes back to the vets. We don't, we don't keep any for, uh, you know, for the staff. Everything go, we raise goes back to the vets, goes back to the hospital program or the junior girls. Whatever we're raising funny, money for, it goes back to that, to that unit. Now, what would it take for somebody to become a member of the Women's Auxiliary or the Ladies Auxiliary? Okay, for somebody to become a member, you have to belong to somebody, either your, your husband or your spouse, your uh, son, grandparent, uh, somebody that did foreign service during war time. Doesn't mean that you were in Nebraska or someplace, you have to have been belong to a unit that did war time. My husband was in Vietnam. There are a lot of younger people here now from Iraq or uh, Afghanistan. Uh, their wives, their daughters, their mothers can join under their eligibility. That sounds great. So that opens the door for a lot of people to become members and participate. Absolutely. And not only that, all of the money does go back to the veterans, whether it be the hospital right. or for cancer, cancer or even in times of service right. for right. if somebody passed away, we yes. help that way yes. also. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things we do here as an auxiliary, 
We, um, if the family requests it, we have a wake, uh, so the family can join here. It's, it's not as stressful for their families to be in a familiar surrounding. We provide food for them. Uh, we also have an auxiliary chaplain that can assist with that. Uh, whatever the family needs in a time of, of crisis like that, we can help them with that. That sounds great. Well, I want to thank you very much for sharing that information with thank us. Thank you. And again, that just proves again how wonderful it is to be a part of this post. I really encourage you to come out here and join us at post 4647. Become part of our family. And it is a family. It is a family. Hey everybody, how y'all doing out there? This is the coolest chef on the planet, Chef Ernesto. And we're here to talk about food today. And today I am going to prepare a simple Parmesan out of chicken. I'm gonna do it two ways. I'm gonna use the breast and the thigh. And we're gonna do that in a second, but the very first thing I wanna do is start the sauce. So I'm gonna turn around over here, oil in the pan just a little bit. And then as that spreads around, I'm gonna throw a little bit of uh, garlic in. Throw a lot of garlic in. And you know what, let's uh, talk about our ingredients here real quick. I have my garlic, my onions, basil, fresh basil, always use fresh herbs, and then I have Parmesan cheese. And then later I have garlic, uh, carrots, and broccoli. Right. So I'm gonna turn around, saute this baby really good, and then I'm gonna add some chopped onion. There we go. Now, what I want to do, and I want that a little bit more oily, so I'll add a little bit more oil. And what I wanted to do is caramelize the onions. Once I caramelize the onions, I'm going to add some white wine to it. And I'm not really going to feature a wine today, but what I'm going to do is pour about three quarters of a cup. And that baby's going to simmer. It's gonna simmer while I focus on this chicken. Now, I am going to take this chicken and debone it. First thing I'm gonna do is cut down the breast. Down the breast bone. Down the center of the chicken. Yes. There we go. Now I'm going to put this baby right back over here, off to the side. Then I am going to, does that look familiar? I'm going to quarter this chicken. What I want to do is make the breast look like a V. So I'm going to come this way, cut it, and then I'm going to turn the corner and cut it just like this. Now, I'm going to turn it over. Here's the breast. I'm going to turn it over and find the connection between the wing and the breast. That makes that simple. This is the, how beautiful the breast looks. Now I'm gonna turn the breast over and I'm gonna cut under the breast bone. Now the thing that we have to do is to be careful about is the collarbone at the top. This takes a minute to Cut this baby, but I want to cut around the collarbone. Now, the collarbone, of course, is the neck bone on the chicken, and that's located. Here's the breast bone. The collarbone is located right at the top. Here's the breast, right at the top of the breast. We want to make sure that we get that out. Let's pull that skin off. Chicken skin, yuck. Okay, now this baby right here is actually the chicken tenderloin. This is what's known as the filet mignon of chicken. This part right here, this is the most tender part that you get. So when they say that they're dealing with chicken tenders, this is the part that they're dealing with. But I'm gonna remove the tender. I'm gonna place the breast right here. Cut that fat off. Put all of this stuff over here. Put the waist over here. Put this over here. And then I'm gonna find a connection between the leg and the thigh. Oh, that's always fun. Now we take the leg, place it over here, 
pull the skin off the thigh. Now with this thigh, I want to, I want to tell you real quick that on a chicken, a thigh, the fat runs along the top and the bottom of the thigh. So when you look at this, the fat running along this way, the leg actually comes out of here and it looks like that. That's how the chicken runs, just like that. So the fat will be located on the bottom and the top. You cut that off. Okay, get rid of that. Get rid of that. Now, I'm gonna cut under. Free the backbone. There we go. That goes over here. And that can go in your stock. Some more fat, we wanna clean that out. Now, I want to come along the bone. This is the thigh, and the bone is running straight up the center. I want to flip it over and cut right on the side of the bone. And then I'm going to kind of chase the cut. I'm going to cut the meat around the bone and cut against the bone. Look at that. Now, it's a beautiful, beautiful looking thigh. Sometimes you can pound the thigh to make it flatter, but I am going to do what we chefs call butterflying, the way I cut. This way, you have the same thickness all over. And I'm gonna do the same thing with the breast. I'm gonna cut it halfway through and butterfly it. Okay. Yeah, I'm just going to cut that part off. How's that? And then we can add that to the chicken tenders and make a snack. This way we have the same thickness. Beautiful. Look at that. Now I'm going to stop for a second. I'm going to change my gloves and I'm going to wash my hands. On my sauce, what I've done is I've reduced the wine down to nothing to cook my aromatics all the way through cook all of the alcohol out and get that wonderful wine flavor. So I will add a little bit more wine and I am going to add fresh basil. Yes. Just a little more. That will reduce. And while this is reducing, I'll tell you about tomatoes. Now, usually when I make a tomato sauce from fresh tomatoes, what I do is I peel and de-seed and squeeze all of the juice out of the tomatoes. And this is the uh, thing that takes about six to eight hours to make. However, if you go to the store and you buy some tomato sauce, which is easier for most people, then all you have to do is open the can. This is already cooked and reduce down to where there's no more water in it. It takes about eight hours in order to cook all of the water out of the tomato. So this is already done. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to add the tomato sauce and then I'm gonna add a spoonful of chicken base. Now this chicken base is the best that I've ever had. It's called Better Than Bouillon, and I get it at Smart and Final, and I think that this stuff is really, really good. The quality is really high, and I would rather do that than to use chicken stock when I'm really in a hurry. But I don't always have time to make chicken stock. Okay. Okay, while that simmers, we'll get started on the veggies. I'm going to pour a little bit of olive oil in that, along with some garlic. And this is really interesting because I never par my vegetables. People say, why don't you par your vegetables, Chef Ernesto? Well, the reason why is because I like to let the wine steam the vegetables and I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. As you can see, I've sauteed some garlic until it's singed 
And then I want to take the carrots and broccoli. Now, as my raw, with my raw veggies, I just take them and saute them in the garlic, and then as the pan gets hot enough, uh -huh. there we go. And that is one of the tricks that I use to make sure that my veggies are properly steamed. However, I steam them with wine as opposed to steaming them in water. Oh my God, that's what I'm talking about. This sauce is very, very delicious. I want to make sure everybody tastes it. It's nice and hot and steamy. Okay. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start to check it. All right. For the chicken. This is the breast. I'm going to pick this up and put this on the pan, and hopefully it'll sizzle like I need it to. There we go. That's what I'm talking about. White meat and dark meat. Most people do Parmesans when they do them. They do them out of white meat. They do them out of the breast. See, the problem with that is that everybody doesn't properly cook a breast. It's always a good idea to cook it to 165 using a thermometer, sticking it in the thickest part of the chicken, it where it registers to 165 and maybe 10 or 15 degrees higher if that's what you choose to do, and allow it to stay 165 for 15 seconds. That's how we kill all pathogens in our chicken. Uh, people, people, uh, white meat tends to dry out. <laughs> a lot of times people will overcook white meat while they're making a parmesan. So. I'm going to show you how to not overcook. I'm going to turn around and I'm going to turn this over and then I'm going to turn it back over. Now note the skin sides down. The reason why the skin sides down because I'm going to place the Parmesan on top of the skin. But what I want to do first is I want to make sure that the skin side down cooks halfway through so when I flip it over I will add the sauce and the cheese to this and allow it to finish cooking and at that time the way I feel like it's finished cooking I will stick a thermometer in it and register the temperature so I can make sure that it's all the way done. Okay, veggies. These veggies are perfect. They're still crunchy. They have a beautiful flavor and let me tell you, they got that wonderful wine flavor and garlic. Oh, man, it's going to be so good. All right. This is the color that I'm looking for when I flip my chicken over. I need it to be nice and tan because that's the first way to tell that the chicken is done is by the color. The second way to tell is by using your meat thermometer. Now, I'm going to reach over here and sauce this chicken. Parmesan cheese. Yes. Okay, let's check the temp. Oh yes, that's it. <laughs> now, I am going to pull this baby off the stove. Yes.
Okay. Hi, I'm Chef Ernesto, and this is my famous favorite chicken parmesan recipe. I make it from dark meat as well as white meat, so that way we can please both crowds. Some people like dark, some people like white. So we're able to take care of business with this dish. Our veggies are cooked and sauteed in garlic oil and butter and deglazed with white wine. So we have a wonderful dish here that's good enough to serve to anybody. I'd serve it to my mom personally. Now, if you're interested in catering, then reach me on my Facebook wall, Chef Ernesto. Or you can go to my Facebook page, Food Talk with Chef Ernesto, which is my radio page. And uh, uh, join me on my radio show, Food Talk with Chef Ernesto, at 6 p.m. on Blog Talk Radio. Just punch in the coolest chef on the planet, and all the information you need will pop up for you to listen to the show. Or you can call the number 213-769-0900 at 6 p.m. on Fridays and listen on your phone. Thank you very much. Hi everybody, once again, uh, this is James L. Allen. This is James L. Allen Country Cooking and Variety Show. I just want to thank my guest that was on the show today. We had Chef Natanya Richardson. We had Chef Ernesto. We had uh, on saxophone, uh, Sean Rayford. And we had uh, Max Perry and uh, Cheryl Asby of the Alzheimer's Aid Society here in Sacramento, California on Cottage Drive, okay? We appreciate you guys coming in to do the show today. And Folks, do tell others about our show, okay? Appreciate you tuning in.